Charlie, how you doing? My name is Richard Jones, Jr. And my name is Fiend. So call me Fiend for the Money International Jones. Tell me about your neighborhood growing up. Uh, my neighborhood growing up was, I'm going to say like any other. It was, you know, but it wasn't suburbia. You know what I'm saying? It was so-called the hood or the ghetto. You know what I mean? But it wasn't a project. You know what I'm saying? It was Hollygrove. Yeah, it was Hollygrove, of course. What you know were your cross streets? Uh, my cross streets were Ember and. Don't have me lie. I was on my own Ember, but my cross streets was Eagle and uh, I, it'll come to me. But I was a block away from the Olive Branch Corner and I grew up full house before Bounce Music was invented by T. T Tucker and DJ Everett. And did you move around a lot or was that, that main house that you were at? Yeah, we um, we moved around a lot. I moved to the third ward, which that which I previously lived in the seventeen ward, which is how I grew up. But I moved to the third ward, um, which is still uptown, around between um, Dallas Shade and General Taylor, uh, a few blocks from Napoleon Avenue. But at the same time, a few blocks from Calio Project you know, and the Magnolia Project. Let's talk about Hollygrove for a minute. Do you remember um, music? Do you remember block parties? Uh, second lines, thanks to your Hollygrove. Um, second lines, some, but m more, I guess you could say, block parties. Like I said, I grew up a few houses from Big Town Tips, which was what was called Ghost Town. So, you know, and my dad on the barroom, a few houses down across from that bar. You know what I'm saying? So, this club on the corner pretty much had a block party. You know. Cause they had this music, it was loud, it was what we were listening to, and all you had to wait for the door to open there once in a while to get the full highs of it. Other than that, you felt it through the walls of the club, still on the street, you know what I'm saying? We didn't have like big house parties per se, you know? But that was the closest thing to house party, block party for us, you know? Your dad's part, did you have, did he have musicians play? Or was it mainly just uh, Very, uh, that was rare, you know? Just pretty much a jukebox. The sound was magnificent in the club, you know. Um, my aunt house was on top of the bar room, you know. That was so dope. My dad's bar room, 8820 Edinburgh Street, uh, Morris Lounge. You know, my dad was proprietor to that for about 40 years. And he's been there since he was 17 years of age. And, um, you know. That scene that as a grown up was my first introduction to music, you know, not just hip hop. You know, I saw singers, you know, that were famous singers come there and visit in this ballroom and wanted to taste the seafood, bro, seafood. And I saw our famous football players used to come there. So, you know what I mean? Eventually, hip hop ended up being something that was across the street because these were what the grown, grown folks were, you know what I mean? Yeah. Musicians in your family? Uh, plenty. Plenty of our vocalists as well. Tell me about him. Um, my uncle, Houseman DeCluet, was lead singer for Galactic, a band that um, locally played here in New Orleans. Um, Tip teams all around the world, uh, as far as I can remember. Uh, one festival for sure. One festival for sure was the Humboldt County Festival. <laughs> I always heard about it as a kid that I couldn't wait to go see them perform. Uh, which I never had a chance to, but. Um, um, who else? Uh, DJ Lil Daddy he was a producer. He used to produce for acts like Tim Smooth, legendary West Bank rapper. Uh, he produced for MC Thick, legendary West Bank rapper. Uh, and he also went by the name of Baby T, which he changed his name to DJ Lil Daddy. Um, uh, can't think of, oh, I have a singer in the family as well, Byron Sharp. You know, he's a single lead singer. He's in a group, Eli Tay. Amazing voice. Um, I have a gang of people. I can't, I, I, if I can come back to it, you know what I'm saying? It'll probably come to me, but I would, a few more people I just can't think of. And I haven't talked to him in a while. But. We were interviewing uh, Zombie earlier, and we were showing you about Eli Tay. Eli Tay, right. You guys had a nice sound. An amazing song. One song I know for sure that dropped down to my knees, man. It's just, I don't know what it was. You heard it, it was like, when you heard uh, Shy, and if I, right? 
And he's like, ah, that happens all the time, right? That song played, they played the song, Drop Down on My Knees. And I was a kid, like, I was like, man, you can't run from this song. You know what I'm saying? And it's just pretty cool R&B all the time. Do you play any instruments? Um, I'm not fluent. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard that. Uh, that's what just dawned to me. I literally I record myself on a Kai PC, PC and I will make layers of a track and I close my eyes and I can say or hum what I'm trying to do and it, I can find those keys. I can find those notes, right? But I couldn't do that in front of a crowd of you know, 350 people just playing fluently. You know what I mean? Like literally like a piano or something. So uh, that's about far as I do. Yeah. So I could credit myself more as a vocalist, more than actual um, instrument playing musician, other than vocals. You know? Singing, rapping, whatever. What was your first public performance? Dancing. You know what I mean? As a kid, uh, Martinez. I went to Martinez. My grandmother was had uh, um, a bus driver uh, and also a teacher at the school, so I went to Martinez, and I remember dancing, loving to, you know, hip hop, dancing, you know, I think that is one of the four um, elements of hip hop, is a DJ, MC, um, dancing, and uh, graffiti. Those are the four elements, if I'm not mistaken, the essential elements of hip hop music. And I started out on my first level, what I could do before I could probably talk good was dancing, you know. Um, so, and from there I would say went to, uh, wanting to rap, right? And uh, from there I began to want to play and make and produce, you know. So what was the first time that you um, made a piece of music that you were really proud of or something like, I could do this for a living? Um, as a whole, or just a it could song? could be anything. It could be, you know, like a rapping in a public performance or uh, something you produced. Anything that you really felt like, I got this. I did a, a song at a studio, and uh, we, we didn't, it wasn't premeditated. I didn't know the track. The track wasn't created for me, and I got a deal to do that by something happening spontaneously in a matter of less than 15 minutes. And I told myself like, wow, you know, I, this, if this isn't a sign that you got it from here, what is, you know? Went to the studio. Well, I did a um, Tuesday, I recorded a intro for radio station, you know, saying like, hey, this is, I'm here with DJ Holly, put your name in it, name of the radio station, call letters. I did that for a, a local radio um, personality by the name of Wild Wayne. He got it Wednesday and played it Wednesday. Thursday, um, they played it again. And Friday, some people had heard it. And Saturday, I was in the studio and recorded my first single, a local hit here in New Orleans. You know, and I was I was on, as they say. You know, I had a deal, one song, performing, getting thousands of dollars performed, three minutes, 18 seconds of a song. Did I know I have no more music, anything, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I would say that was my first time uh, with uh, the baddest mother alive, you know, off of Big Boy Records. Who did you meet first? Did you meet Precise or did you meet K.O.? I would, I met, I must say I met K.L. first because he was a DJ at a club called Ooh. Was it rumors? Were rumors in the Seven War by the tracks? Right by the tracks down the street from Jeans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, rumors. Was it rumors? Nah, that's way before me. That's like, yeah, rumors like you had amnesia, you had the biggies, it was club rumors. Club rumors, right? And uh, Kel was DJing up in there, so. About what year was this? Oh, man, it's, wow. 89, 90. Wow, you know what I mean? I was up in there with Musa, Devious, uh, just the Sadie, which is Mr. Marcelo, uh, Bricks, you know? Um, 
we was making moves and DJ Mellow fellow. So I was a kid. I've always been around hip hop. I have a very unique upbringing. You know, my mom, I played sports and stuff like that, but my mom could have easily been like, you know, dude, you know, you're too young, this, that, and the other. Man, I was on tour, 13 years old, with MC Thick, Buzz Down, Tim Smooth. She's like, go see for yourself, because I'm not going to keep hearing this. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't a true, too much troublesome kid. You know what I'm saying? But I was always around grown, serious men. You know what I mean? So I saw a lot of stuff early. Well, how did that tour when you were 13 come about? It was dope, you know? It was grown up like a mother, you know what I'm saying? But it was dope to see these dudes performing songs that you love already locally, put your ballets on, Morero, I Don't Give a Damn, Tim Smooth, you know what I'm saying? To see all this happening and be right there. Like, I've been friends with UGK since I was 12. You know what I'm saying? To do, you know what I mean? Like, these are. People, you know what I'm saying, like the world know as, you know what I'm saying, like almost superheroes. And these are my friends, you know what I'm saying? Because I was a jit, I was a kid, you know what I'm saying? So I fell in love with hip hop. I was sick. I got bit by that shit. I, I was sick. I had to have it. I had to have it. I wrote it poems first. And um, I eventually I started rhyming, you know what I'm saying? Man, it bit me. I was man. I was messed up. I watched How everything. How did you meet all these people? I mean, you know, so you're hanging out. You're 12 up, years old. I grew up four houses from where bounce music was invented. You know what I'm saying? So the biggest promoter, Ghost, riding the lacks, the limousines. He was four blocks away and was my man to my dad. So I got first. I got public enemy cassette favorite Black Planet reached to me by Chuck D from Flavor Flav. You know what I'm saying? I was shell toes when on the same concrete with Run DMC. You know what I'm saying? The cash money click. Like, I was meant for this. This is, I couldn't run from it. Like, that's how sick it was. This is listen to how sick it was. If I couldn't go to a concert, which I didn't go to a lot of them, Slick Rick was huge, you know, LL, Run DMC, Fat Boy, all kind of stuff, right? I didn't go to a concert. In my mind, I, 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 I asked the cat, I asked the cat, he was the concert, in my mind, why I knew what Slick Rick was wearing and I wasn't even there. That's how sick I was with it. I said, I bet he had on a purple silk suit, huh? Short sleeves, some things like, how you know? I, said, I don't even know. To me, that's some fly shit. He should have worn. You know what I'm saying? That's how sick I was. And I'm a hip hop baby. I just, everything is an analogy to hip hop. I'm going to sing some shit to you and I can just sold it to you because I'm, I'm, I got bit by it. This is the first form of audio heroin I've ever experienced in my life and I've been st stuck in this euphoria of life all my life since I've known what it was. You know what I'm saying? And I have never left. <laughs> I have never left. You know what I'm saying? I go to, <laughs> you know, like people say AA meetings and rehab and shit and taking hiatus and I, I, I'm, I'm sick with it. Like, you know what I'm saying? And even to this day, I'm still, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop, it, you know, save your life. It could take lives, it's like anything. Too much of anything, too, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know what I mean? Like, and where we from, here in New Orleans, we have our own version of it. Cause we fuck with everybody, you know, but we dangerous as shit, you know what I mean? And that's crazy, you know what I'm saying? We got the richest culture in the United States, you know what I'm saying? We got the oldest African American neighborhood in America. You know, we're so rich with this, but we dangerous. And so it's blind, it's polluted to know that the world see how important we are. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? It's like a criminal trying to tell you I'm the future of keeping the beast calm, of music. I'm, I, they all have to come here. They got to come here. You know what I'm saying? But we can't because of our previous records. I got a book this thick about what I done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's what I represent, Congo Square and Rap Farm. As a hip hop kid, I was bitten by it. And I, I had to, to me, I had to be cold. You know what I'm saying? What would you say to people who say that rap isn't traditional music here? Is it isn't traditional? A lot of people will tell you um, that rap is not traditional music, and of course it is. So what would you say? I would say that that's only because they rate us on 
a stereotypical success rate of what's hip hop. You know, every city had their lane of music. Every state, you know, have their bigger music that that stands out more. You know, you go a little bit up. I believe it's more down south, or is it more? No, excuse me, more northern Louisiana. You may run into Zydeco. When Zydeco is a bigger form, get a bigger fan base of that. So they may have people that come out that want that. That's what that's that's the um, that's what they're tuned into. You know what I'm saying? That's the vibe they on. You know what I'm saying? So that's where they at. You know, our vibe, we love it all, but we have our own. It's like um, Chuck Brown. It's like go-go music. You know, it's loud and it's blaring. You know what I'm saying? So people can't really enjoy a, a high volume of it. So you can go out and enjoy it for the night party and dance, but you may not want to hear it in the car because it's not... Is not balanced enough, you know what I'm saying, and and made fashionable enough for you to enjoy it on a regular basis, you know, to know about backyard rare essence, I, you know, a gang of other um, bands that do go go that should be on some type of levels for that's their representation of music, but everybody can rap there, you know what I'm saying, but it's like bounce music. We got bounce music that isn't our only best representation of music. So we don't have too many Michael Jordans or Larry Birds or James Worthy's or Scottie Pippins of accomplishments of music. You know, the biggest uh, hoorah they give us is Cash Money Records, No Limit Records. But we have all forms of music and the best form of it. You know what I'm saying? It's just not a New York, a big, this big city that have all this other promotion that comes with it being the first of what Bert was given of this on the West Coast, you know what I'm saying? We don't have that. You know what I'm saying? Well things like Jazz Fest, you know, and Jazz Fest is um, notorious for not really booking that many rap musicians. Um, you know, rap isn't really played on WWOZ. So there's this clear divide between like this is traditional, this is jazz, this is brass band, this is my grand dance, and here's rap way right. over here. And, um, you know, obviously it's all mixed in and everybody is making all these different types of music. And it's not like, you know, I only do rap over here and don't do anything else. People do everything because they're making music and they're making the music they love. But um, It got a bad rap, mm -hmm. you know, even me now, it, it has a bad rap. By you naming what you just naming, my, in the back of my mind already, I'm saying, we don't, we don't need all that young shit here, that young ignorant shit, thinking about bounce or rap, because that's just a bad rap it got. You know what I'm saying? I just a bad rapper guy. So you constantly promote it like that. If you constantly promote showing something different of what we're doing, you did see it and enjoy it more and want it there, you know what I'm saying? But they're not seeing that. They're seeing the news. This one murdered, this one shot, this one burned alive, this one kidnapped, this fight broke out when it comes to our color and our culture and the music. So it's a, it's a stain, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, you, you're not thinking. Right now, if you ask a friend, oh man, you wanna go to this rap concert? They might be like, oh, what? You know, because what, what we getting into? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's because it's how it's been depicted compared to, hey, you wanna go to a jazz concert? You wanna go to a blues concert? They got Zydeco around the corner, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's what it has been promoted as, you know what I'm saying? That's a whole nother, you know, a whole nother, uh, day for us to communicate like you know what I'm saying I'm to the bottom of this shit I know what why it's perceived you know why I would never get it's complete that's why I have reinvented myself to do Congo Square rap form because you can't run from me with a band you can't run from me you you can't run from it you know what I'm saying you're gonna say what what is rap this is that it's 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 rap I'm gonna call it Aqua Soul. I'm gonna name it something else because pictures just fiend is just too dangerous for you. You thinking all kind of shit. So I'm gonna just call it something else and just pack it as a rag, it's just, you know, rag and something else, pack it as something else for you to enjoy because a lot of people run away from what? Things that they don't know. Just like the guy at the corner store. You know, most people are not running up in a Middle Eastern store giving you money and shit. You don't know him. For the fact that that unknown factor, you're not fucking with him. And that's how they feel. We, it's the unknown factor. You know what I'm saying? You, if you get to know him, you get, you got camaraderie. And, and become a community, not a hood. You know what I'm saying? And all that starts from there. That's, you know, that's, that's why, you know what I mean? Like, 
a mature rap or a growing up rap, there's, there's less volume of consumers. You know what I'm saying? Everybody not reading. Everybody won't, you know, before it was turn up, they won't get crunk. Before they got crunk, they won't get buck, whatever. You you know, people, you got some people want to go and not think of nothing. I just want to let go. I don't want to think, you know, I don't want to club and think. <laughs> I just want to not give a fuck, you know? And they got that right. And they got some people that want to go to think, to chill, to, you know, be around the right vibe and uh, tune into the right vibe. So I think if you divide that and put that in the right settings, you'll have people getting um, their credit due as being just as grand as a Jay-Z, um, a big uh, Biggie, you know, a Tupac, you know what I'm saying? Without all the additives, he got shot up 30 times. And, you know what I'm saying? Just to accelerate. What was Ghost Town like? Ghost Town was like crazy. Just imagine this was the club. Plus maybe 20 more feet out, right? Music blaring, and you got this DJ and this rapper running off of two records on the turntables, just running these bitches back in a mixer off of a uh, showboy's drag rap song, and just looping this shit, just looping it. You heard me? Found the instrumental, looping it, and this dude grabbing the mic, and he ain't had much to say. But what he was gonna say was gonna have you on the edge of your toes. You know what I'm saying? Oh my God, he spoke, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? Like that type of shit over a beat that you couldn't help but just, oh, don't play me up here, you know what I'm saying? From a city where all niggas know is dropping these nuts, don't fuck with me. I promise you, don't fuck with me. That's, that's where we from. You had to get to a, a relationship or a brotherhood or camaraderie to win we was cool enough, you could lax up in the club. Like, other than that, in the heart of Holly Grove, in one of the hearts, because they had more than one heart, that's some other shit. But it was dope. It was it was dope. People walking, coming from everywhere to want to go to Ghost Town. You don't know who he might have in there. Run DMC, Big Daddy Kane, Tim Schmo, anybody. We were talking about um, neighborhood differences and regional variations, mm -hmm. stylistic. Um, is there a Holly Grove style? that's different from other places, that's different from Cali, that's different from Ninth Ward. How, how are they different? Would, would you put into those words, or? For me, personally, I look at Hollywood Grove like 300. You know what I'm saying? You're not gonna hear too many say, oh, he wishy-washy, ah, he, eh. you know what I'm saying, about a person you should know their name from this neighborhood. That's what I know about Hollywood Grove. You know what I'm saying? I heard I don't know too much about pretty a much of other neighborhoods, so I can't speak on like represent them. You know what I'm saying? I know a few cats, I don't know if that best represent those neighborhoods. But I that's one thing I knew no matter where I went about myself and the men that I walked these neighborhoods with. If there was a few you knew their name, this is a solid individual. You know what I'm saying? More than on some just some fugazi, you know, you know, and that's hard to come by them errors because you know these are a lot of young men forced to be men, you know, when education wasn't the most important thing. Like, that's a ghost town, but you know, hustling. When I think of ghost town, I think of, you know, just, man, hustling. You know what I'm saying? You got the dope man chain, eight ball jackets and shit. You know what I'm saying? You know, you probably had your cutlass or regal. You might have had some hundred spokes on it, whatever the rims was at that time. Fresh, how it grow cats, fresh, you know what I'm saying? They're coming with it. That's what it is, you're gonna see us, you know? Um, and Ghost Town was valid. A, a club everybody had to go to. You was crazy if you didn't know what it was to go to Ghost Town to see T.T. Tucker and DJ Irv perform where they at, you know? Your song Ghost Town off of um, was in Session. How does that relate to that club? What makes you, what was the writing behind that? Ghost Town is, um, a lot of people look at us as being a third world country domestically. So, I don't know if you've seen any of them Robin Williams movies when they go to the islands and they like the islands not being a tip top shape, you know what I'm saying? But he's there, <laughs> so he's gonna make the most of it. But that's what that was about, just as kind of like a glimpse of just, day-to-day -day walking for a man of my caliber in this city. You know what I'm saying? You got respect, but at the same time, you know, somebody may, 
may not like that. You know, you may have money, but then again, you don't have enough money. You know what I'm saying? You know, uh, all the girls want your time when they see you hustling. You know what I'm saying? Just real life. You know what I mean? That's what those times was about, where I'm from. It wasn't necessarily about that club. It was about my city. You know what I'm saying? So that best represented that in a, in a, in a I guess, of a dark but cool Euro sense, but an island, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I see it. I've been overseas a gang of times. That's how I see it, you know, when you used to walk to the red, like, district, and they had theme music with that shit. That's how I looked at it, you know? Tell us a story about um, Carpet Combat, like being down there, maybe something recorded there, something that sticks out, doesn't have to be crazy, it's just something that you can remember. Parkway Pumper and I remember 3 9 Posse. You know KLC, MC Dark, Mooshack. Got what it takes to make it. Mm -mm 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 You know what I'm saying? That that was dope. I walked through high school with a radio cassette. Thank God I had C D. You know, uh Ask these hoes. You know that was mystical voice on the chorus? Ask them hoes. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. He was in a service from what I heard at the time. And this dude was like four blocks away from me. And we didn't meet just yet, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, Parkway Parkman. Uh, innovators on uptown music in a New Orleans scene, for sure. Where did you record your big boy stuff? Where were we all recording out of? Uh, the studio in the East. It had come to me. But it was a studio in the East, and uh, this guy named Mark owned it. Man, why well, I can't think. It was a famous studio, too. They have a, a whole lot of them. Famous studio, this guy, Mark. I remember this tall white guy, man. Real thin, he was cool as shit. You know what I'm saying? Mark's like, hey, what's up, man? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he had his guitarist named Sean. He was always there. He was just, that was my first experience of a studio. I just thought it was so fucking cool. You know what I'm saying? People that was patient with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was dope. It wasn't no hurry up, pressure, you know, or just who's this kid? You know what I mean? But um, it'll come to me, the name of the studio. It's right off of Dwyer. Off of Dwyer. Across uh, Chef. Man, yeah. But that was uh, my also two inch reel. Big Boy Records, DJ Precise, made the baddest in Mouth Alive. Wasn't even for me, it was for Sporty T. I was just sitting holding the wall, chilling. And he made this track, and I'm with Hunter some shit. He's like, man, what you saying? I was like, I'm the baddest man. He like, man, pick up the phone. Say, uh, say, bro, uh, I know I've broken up beef for you. But, uh, man, I'm going to go ahead and make you something else, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that was that. I, I had some verses in my head. I got in the booth. It was done. And, it, you know what I mean? That was my first experience of, for myself. I had experience that as I fly on the wall with Devious, DJ Melafella and Musa recording with DJ Precise working on a Devious album. Man, that dude cold as shit. How is uh, Chaos production style different from um, Precise's? Um, Precise's production, KLC's production is more drums. More drums and bass. And bass lines, more digital bass lines at one time. I'm gonna say that's how the world probably saw. Them. And Precise was using a the guitarist then more, I'm gonna say, as you know, from what I saw. So I thought that was a little bit different, you know. And uh, Precise had nice mixes and just dope production, you know, Kale, I could just. I must just say it was just more drums and he was what you to me if what they call boom bap of south of the south you know what I mean and Sice was a little bit more musical that's what made those guys just all first hand you know so, different so how did No Limit come about who did you meet first what happened uh I know Limit came about is that I had some homeboys that I was working with them. And um, these cats had a good thing going and they had uh, a, a 
a partner as well that were rooting for them to make it in the music business. I ended up getting with their partner that they had just recently got acquainted with. And he believed in my music and wanted to put me out as an artist, you know, uh, on his label. Um, things didn't go well because they didn't really have a whole lot of know-how in the music business. They had all the heart and dedication, but just somehow, you know, you don't really know what places to go, when to do it, what you, your, your waste money, misappropriate funds, as they say, in the, in the industry. And then it slowed things up, you know. But that's how I got to the limit, you know what I mean? You know, and um, this guy's doing three licenses right now, you know. And uh, one of the last things he did was wanted to make sure I pursued my music. And that was something extra, you know what I'm saying? This person pushed for me because that if he had not pushed for me, just knowing how to rap good and stuff, you know, that helps. And this guy was willing to put money behind me off the rip. They'd already had me on some songs. Me and X had got me on a song, got me familiar with that label and the brand. Um, who else? Kenan Abel had got me on a song, I believe, and got me familiar with the label and the brand. You know, KLC was vouching for me. But this cat really, you know, was like, you know, I know you're here with the type of talent he got and shit, but, you know, how about I put up some money to let you know I'm serious for him to be heard to the world, you know what I'm saying? And that's what really pushed that envelope, you know, to make that happen for me, 96, early 97. And where were we all recording out of when you first got with them? We recorded uh, at um, No Limit Studios, which was off of Corporate Boulevard in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's where we recorded, third floor in this uh, building off of Corporate Boulevard. And Servan was telling us that it was kind of like y'all had to hang out, just wait in the studio, and if you left, then you would lose out on your chance to record with that song. And so you just had a lot of people like vying. There was a lot of healthy competition between it. Um, and I said it worked out well, and you missed a lot of opportunities because he went he went back to New Orleans. It's like snake back to New Orleans and hang out and do stuff. Um, what was the first time that you got on? You got a feature that on a big song that you were like right on. My first solo record on uh, about a soundtrack, you know, me and P just connected, you know what I'm saying? You know, he saw I wasn't bullshitting, and what I'm talking about is real, you know what I'm saying? I think that did it, you know what I'm saying? Because he literally put this in a part of a movie, he was, in his movie, he was shooting, he was like, man, fuck. Hey, you know what I'm saying? This is where I was coming from as a kid, being in the passenger seat, ride with these serious men, you know what I'm saying? My brothers, guys, you know what I mean? Good people, beautiful people, but just had just serious lifestyles, you know what I'm saying? So, when I saw his reaction and how he moved to put it in the movie, where he put it in the movie, I knew it was real. You know what I'm saying? I knew it was real, and he knew it was, this, this, this kid can project what he see, and they they might they gonna listen, you know. And he took a chance, and I think that was that. And from that day on, I just I, I never left the studio, you know. I I was there uh, five days straight, didn't go to sleep. You know, every time he walked in, I was there. I was on so much shit, it got annoying some people. I made enemies to some point, you know, not choosing to, but that's just how I work. Like I said, I, I got bit by hip hop, you know, and I just I want it. And that's what went down, you know. Every time he recorded, you know, I was on six, seven songs on Masterpiece Ghetto D, one of his highest, um, I'm gonna say, pinnacle points of his career, of knowing that, you know, success was definitely, you know, in his palm, you know. Where did Wong Wong come from? Uh, Wong Wong comes from doing a. Um, a, a soldier song what we had records that were labeled soldier songs that I open your album up on uh, Silk the Shockers album Charge to the Game and I started my verse off saying like want my problems remember me fiend the one that told you shot it and um, I was so hyped the track was coming I'm like eh, oh and I was just hyped you know what I'm saying so I was like Womp, 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 my problem, you know what I'm saying? So Kel was like, screw, man, what the fuck would you just say? 
And I was like, huh? And he was like, man, what was you saying before your verse? And I was like, wah, 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 wah. He was like, man, do that shit again. Do that again. And um, I, I, for whatever it became, I tamed it off the rip. You know what I'm saying? You know how you don't own something, dog. I owned it. It's doing it again. You know what I mean? And that was the birth of, of Mr. Womp Womp or this ad lib that lets you know my presence is to be felt. You know? And yeah, that's where I came from. Crazy. Crazy. It's a big song. It was. I started not to do it too. Uh, right. But, you know, I feel like it was commercial. Like, I'm about to just take myself out of the game. You know what I'm saying? But then um, the beat came around the chorus. And um, I don't know. I just came back from Europe. I had a whole nother feel. You know what I'm saying? My chest was out and shit. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I've seen the fucking world, man. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing I can't do. I executive produced the album myself. You know what I mean? Like, that's the first album to ever be turned into No Limit Records. Like, no, oh, here's my album. You know, that was unheard of to a person who was stubborn about knowing they were right about their business, which he is, excuse me, was at that time. Creative marketing genius, Master P. Person Miller. I salute him to this day. You know, he really was ahead of his time and knew what he wanted. And I love that about this guy. You know, he came up with this one in their family, the title, you know. I'm just looking at him work, and he and to me, he, he loved what he did. It wasn't just, he was hustling, but he got it. You know what I mean? And he wasn't selfish to give me an opportunity. And I appreciated that, you know what I'm saying? You know, it worked out differently on the long run, financially, but it's business, right? But um, that's where that came from, and, and I'm happy that we did it too. You spent a lot of time with Mia and a ton of records with her. What's the contribution of women in hip hop in New Orleans? The contribution of women in hip hop in New Orleans, um, just as valid as a man. You know what I'm saying? Other than you know it's a woman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because they were just successful. You know, me and X was. I mentioned her when I mentioned Tim Smooth. I, I mentioned her when I mentioned MC Thick or Buzz Down because she were one out of four mothers. Which you know, here you feel four fathers, but she was one of our four mothers. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but it's gonna work, right? So uh, she did that. She laid them bricks down for us, and was dope, and is dope at it. And there's so many, uh, you know, female rappers and stuff who um, Silky Slim, who perform a ton, but you know, they they just don't perform as much, and so they don't get as well known. But they're so so talented. So many of them. They are. Um, you never know, man. This is one of them businesses, man. Like. A woman has to, of course she has to go just as hard. I just think that you never know why they never get their full go. Mia got hers, Silky Slim got hers, Ghetto Twins, Miss T, Kitty Black, Magnolia Shorty. Um, they had some girls previously, I don't know all of them. But they all, you know what I'm saying? It's just, I feel like it's so harder for women in here because I'm not saying this happened for all of them, right? But this is what it look, look like. It's just the obstacles that come before them. They might end up having a relationship with the CEO. They might end up having a relationship with the producer. The husband or boyfriend don't care for them doing rap music and guys wanting them all the time. They had so many little, like, like little landmines set before them, you know, obstacles. They had to walk around very carefully to be successful. So I think, you know, it was a little bit harder for women, you know? Well, the reason I asked, especially at that time, you know, I mean, everybody was so hard. And, right. you know, I mean, people here are hard, the music's hard. And so it's that much harder for, you know, a woman to come in on and just to figure out, you know, what lane she's going to be in and how she's going to go. And was there any kind of backlash from that? Just because there was such a macho kind of... Uh, I don't know. I, I I think I don't know. I don't really. Don't At know. least for me, she was always welcome. I think she had a different platform. You know, she was with a, a guy that had major distribution and the marketing and promotion to go with it, to mesh with it. You know, 
Um, I don't know uh, the business plan that these other ladies were involved with on the, on the labels of their recordings, but I I was there for Mia to see what went down. I was there for Ghetto Twins to see what went down. So I believe that's why they had got to those different uh, pedestals, you know, in their careers. I think that's all what plays with it, you know, because um, they did it. They wanted some hard stuff, and the, the, them ladies gave it to them. Cheeky Black, you know what I'm saying, they gave it to them. You know, they, I think that uh, it was on them. They constantly just show the world what type of artists they were. You know, but the rest of the world love it too. I just think that they never got those chances, you know, major videos to get on major networks, you know? They were always stumped somewhere, their growth. What was it like when, I mean, No Limit just went international? It just went really big, really fast, and I mean, there was so much hard work, but then at the point that it started picking up speed, it got really big, really fast. <laughs> it did. So, I mean, what was that like to be in the of that was it just mind blowing or it was like having uh like diplomatic immunity or something you know what i'm saying like that's what it felt like you know honestly through the airport in the streets in the neighborhoods if that was what you were doing it just made it so much of a green card and a pass in other areas and jungles of this America, you know what I mean? That some people wouldn't dare to go or some people wouldn't know to go, you know? That's what I think. And it, it made a few people give us a few more chances, which I'm to this day so appreciative for, you know what I'm saying? Excuse me. Um, that's, that's, that's what came out of it, you know? Uh, you know Man, it's a drug, man. It's a drug. And imagine they want it from you, Holly. Imagine they want it from you to when they want it and you know they want it. And all you got to do is go make it and go to the club Friday and you're going to hit it if you made it Thursday. And they're going to play it over and over. And when you walk in, be so surprised and happy to see you. You know what I'm saying? And... You know, it was a, it's a drug, man. It's a drug. That's what it was like. Yeah. Euphoria, <laughs> you know. That, uh, do your ass something was doing that bounce shit. Uh, well, what is? I, 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 I was gonna ask. So, what Why? is it about bounce? Like, I'm gonna tell because they were hustling. They were like, man, what you want that bounce? Fuck that, pick it, pick it, man. Record me right quick. You know what I'm saying? That's what it was about. All the extra rap shit, like that was cool. Like we we got that, and we did that. But man, like you know, them dudes trying to bust them a jug right quick, like hit them a lick. You feel me? Because they ain't trying to live like this and like that. They're like, boy, look, come on, come on. You know what I'm saying? Everlasting hit man. You know what I'm saying? Pimp daddy. You know what I'm saying? Feel how I feel. Like that shit was real, man. Talking like you know what I'm saying? Like this shit was real. This is a fucking jungle here. You know what I'm saying? I'm from an era where. Man, like, you know what I'm saying? Look, you 12, 11 years old, get up street call, man, dudes a mob your ass asking where you from. Where, where you what nigga you where you from, bro? You know what I'm saying? Stomp your ass out right quick. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. We got hosp we the most hospitable people. We'll put your ass in a hospital though. I don't know what that is. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't wake the fucking natives. You know what I mean? And that's what I get from here. And I'm so happy that it's just not like that no more. But it's like that still. You know what I'm saying? It's safer, that's what we're talking It's safer about. to me. Like, man, like, shoot, my God. I got past 25. I'm like, man, you got a plan for me. You know what I mean? Because picture, man, it's like they get it. It's like I damn this shit have an S on my chest and a fucking bulletproof armor uniform on when I walk places. Because that's what I've achieved in my life as a minority, as a musician, as an artist. Like, you know what I'm saying? And I'm so grateful. Like, man, you know what I'm saying? I don't even see the dumb shit some of these dudes be going through in their life because they got to get to that respect. You know what I mean? And that's the type of nonsense that we have, too, that holds us from accomplishing what you need to accomplish in music here. We're crabs in a barrel. I'm not disrespecting my people. And I mean any race can be whatever ignorant name you could think of. That's what, that's what I love about New Orleans. 
or oh, anybody could be that. <laughs> you feel me? It's a crab in a barrel. If you can come out of that, get with like minds, our music will really transcend to where it got to go. We don't have that. You got 4,000 rappers. If I gave you a day or a month out of the year and 3,999 of us came and support you and we filmed that shit, the world would be on us. But instead, the 3,999 is going to fucking compete with your ass. You know what I'm saying? And it just goes every day, every year, every year. And then wait till the world receive us to be like, I ah, know he was, she was going on, oh, that's my people, you know what I'm saying? And you be like, you was the main fucking person that should have took concert, B. I couldn't even reach you a CD. Use that shit as a fucking coaster. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's, that's what I don't like about here. We're the most talented people in the world. We keep fighting each other. You don't see that shit in a uh, country. You don't see that shit in jazz. You don't even see that in pop. Why do you think it became that way? It's just tradition. It's like slaves. It's like, you know, motherfucker been whipped in their heads so much. They just stuck on stupid. You got to show a person. You got to leave here to know your value. Other than that, you a piece of shit. Just like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? They don't see that you're a diamond in the rough. They don't know you was a piece of coal. You know what I mean? It might be 30 carats underneath that coal. Somebody got to see that enough to know that this is something special or other than that, man, I don't know. Everybody nibble off our culture here from other places to make something off of because we don't know the value of what we have. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not knocking people from coming here and drinking our wines, being with our women, experiencing our lives and then making a livelihood off of the shit. I'm saying, when are we gonna do it? You know? That's the only thing I don't get about this city. You know, and we don't have no examples. You know, you stop showing chiwi, hair curled, African-American people on TV being arrested and show them holding a guitar, maybe, a six string bass, cello, maybe, you know, a violin. Maybe some people will be more, you know, um, positioned to maybe want to ask a guy on an elevator, hey man, you play instrument. Instead of grabbing or clenching a purse, it's, it's, it's stupidity. That's, you know, it's racism still. Like, it's the South, way down South. You know what I'm saying? We got all that, we got all those layers just to enjoy music. You know what I'm saying? You know, tourism is our biggest um, buck here. You know, tourism is our biggest buck here. You know, we raise musicians. How many other places you don't name raise musicians? Did you hear what I just told you? This is a part of your mind that it will never be the same thing you know, when you present it. You know, you are a creature of habits. You know what I'm saying? This is a special part of your mind. You learn to play an instrument, guitar, a xylophone. You know what I'm saying? Like we raise musicians. When people raise football players and raise presidents, we raise musicians. You know what I mean? And we need to cherish that. You gotta, you know, you have to cherish that. It should be more schools other than a Norco or, or something like that that's dedicated to um, fine tuning these great minds. And therefore, you, I think we'll get there. Other than that, it's just rough, man. You got layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers, and layers of bullshit. You know, it's, there's no thought. I'm, you're not raised here thinking, yeah, I could, you think, oh, I might can't really, you know. Man, you know you can't do that shit. Or you better just get you a fucking job at the fucking restaurant. Some shit, you know what I'm saying? So we just getting to a point now, that's what I love about kids right now. They don't care what they're wearing, they don't, it's just accentuating who they are, you know? Great beings, great minds, you know what I'm saying? Be who you are, man. Be who you are, little mama, you know what I'm saying? I think if we did that more, the music would get somewhere. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to have to be the nation, uh, the city where technology is. We got our own, our right. For musicians, we raise musicians. What soothes the beast? You know what I'm saying? And we need to nourish that. For a fine example, Cash Money, Lil Wayne. They nourish that boy. They nourish that man. And look at him. He's a world-renowned problem to the world. A, a writer of great music that his generation, generations after and after, before him, gonna have their own time capsules of what that was like to experience that from here. You know what I'm saying? 
And that's what we don't get because they don't reside here every day because they can't be nursed here. Put on a pedestal, given the key to the city, appreciate it to continue to be who you are and keep being an addition to what we have, to our culture. Till we do that, it's just gonna be what it's gonna be. You know what I'm saying? Somebody gotta do something. Talking ain't talking don't mean shit. You gotta do something. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm here and I'm talking like, and I read it just to wanna know what what I was talking about. Even though he explained to me a few um, a few points in, in his vocal syllabus he gave me. You know what I'm saying? I just wanted to know what, because I wanna make my contribution. It's gonna be a time capsule for kids to know what this ain't no easy city to grow up in. You know, I graduated, my teachers was on strike. You know what I mean? I got a diploma. Figure, go figure, you know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's on you. It's choice, it's on you. You took uh, time off. You were always making music, but you took some time away from the spotlight. At what point, I mean, did you ever think about, you know, no, I mean, I'm just gonna make music on the, on the side, I'm gonna produce, I'm gonna step away. What made you wanna get back in front of people and start performing again? Uh, I, 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 shit, I'm, a, I'm an addict to it. My name is Fiend. Uh, <laughs> it's not my first AA me, you know. <laughs> I'm, uh, that's me. I love music and I wanted to, this is how I, this is what I mastered in. You know, some people may have a master's in this and eat doing this. You know what I'm saying? I have a master's in music. So I want to be able to make a living off of what I went to school for almost 20 years for. That's what I want to do. You know, other than do something that's just get me by. And I know my passion lie at. So that's what made me return and also feed my family, you know. I have consumers that's into my brand or what I do. So what I'm gonna just stop doing it for, you know? And it's always a thrill of reinventing the wheel, making that music, you know? Where were you from, Gina? I was in Natchez, Mississippi, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, assisting 34 people, 20 in my house, 14 in my office. Mm -hmm. In your office, you still have an office at that bridge? Now I close it down, which is on top of the Brahma movie theater off of uh, Florida Boulevard. It was an old movie theater in Baton Rouge, owned by Fred Williams, who put out the Dolomite movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything, you know, my, I feel like my path has just been laid before me. It's on me to pick the roads. You know, I was able to create work that makes dope music, you know. Had a real unique sound, you know. I had guys that had these million dollar studios you know, and that worked for them, but they'll come there and hear my sound coming out of my spot, and we're like, God damn, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I don't see it's a, you know, it's a blessing in disguise, you know, I need, I have what I need. You know, I had spookle space for storage, you know what I'm saying? Do you want to talk at all about analog versus digital, like we were talking about? Analog versus digital is like having a digital girlfriend that you may date during your playing Zelda. You want to save the princess? Maybe I'll go it again. Uh, compared to having a real life woman going to port a car with a shit burger. That's analog versus digital. You know, true warmth from analog just true warmth, you know, to, to put your hand over a light bulb and know what that heat does, to feel that, that's what analog is. Compared to a plug-in heater that we gotta, gotta wait to get going to just feel something. You know what I'm saying? It's not the greatest scenario, but it's a difference. You know what I mean? Certain stuff you plug up, you gotta wait till it warm up to use it. You know what I mean? And you still record it. I still, from time to time, I, I normally record um, percussions on analog. I don't tell a lot of people that. It's like Dave Copperfield telling you how he made Statue of Liberty disappear or something, you know what I'm saying? It's like a studio secret of weapons of choice. Percussions, drums, bass lines, snares, kicks, cymbals, all cut on two and three. Some of your um, most recent mixtapes and stuff you've done in the last years is um, some of my favorite stuff you've ever done. Word. Thank and you. Um, Tennis Shoes and Tuxedos, I know you said uh, a lot of that just came from you wanting to make something that was happy, make something that made you happy. Right. Um, 
what was the initial um, impetus? Like, I know you said before you wanted to do something that to repackage it in a different way to make it a broader audience. Right. Where, what mindset were you in then when you were doing that? Tennessee is sexy. Uh-huh. Man. And which one is your favorite? I mean, you've got what, four, uh, I think five, six in the past three, four, five years? Uh, it's a couple. It's a couple. But, um, in the past three years, four years? Yeah. Yeah, anything since... Uh, it's 12. I got like 12 to 14 projects I put out. And uh, since you Tuxedo, man, it was just real life. And I just wanted to celebrate, you know. I, I just lost my... I got married. And right after I got married, I lost my dad like a month later. And I just was in a a thrilled place, you know. You know, when you're forced to be smiling and stuff because that's what you do at funerals and stuff. And um, I thought about all the stuff he, him and I was talking on. Son, give them what they want so you can do what the fuck you want. God, please, son, just get, you know what I'm saying? Um, and man, he used to jam. Like I said, he had a bar room. He was a proprietor of a bar room, mixologist for 40 plus years. So I, I, all these music, I was in at the jukebox and stuff. I took some of these samples and I, I just you know the vibe to him and I was like it was me and him in the studio and I'm gonna make something that I know he'd have been proud of he'd have been like you know like like man son oof man that's sweet Mary Jane boy oh my goodness you know what I'm saying like son the Marvin though you know stuff that I know he would have been blown away by you know and uh, to, to be his age and to be able to get with my age. So I found that I could bridge the gap. So that was what I was about. I wanted to be happy. I didn't want to be sad. I wanted to celebrate his life. So I did tennis shoes and tuxedos, you know. I wanted to make it to when anybody would get it, you know, if they really if they listen to it. Got some samples, got some music, got some tracks. And man, just express myself, man. I just, I just express myself. I'm so happy I did because um, it's a feeling I can't even tap into just off the whim in the studio right now, you know. Uh, the intro to Tennis Shoes and Tuxedo got to be one of my favorite joints. Um, uh, a toast. I was on uh, Smoking Champagne. Um, uh, what's, what's, what's that joint? You know what I mean? That's me. Wow. Noir. Wow. Man, like, you know, man, my approach feels stupid, man. I feel like, man, like, who fucking with me? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if you know what this is like. Man, this shit got to be close as being on cocaine, heroin, and just high on life if that was just a drug in a bottle. It had to be. It had to be. I felt like I never played with words like I did. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what made me do it. I was just all over a track. You know what I mean? Every crevice of a track, I'm just on it. And I and whatever that is, I like it. I like it a lot. And I got to have that now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What do you think about when you're mm-hmm. rapping? Okay, we got two minutes left. Oh. What do you think about when you're mapping? What, what, um, do you have something that goes through your head? Um, is it like playing an instrument to you? Uh, do you think about something in particular? Yeah, now it's from an international standpoint. Now I want a kid in Scotland to be like, Yo, yo, Dougie, Dougie's fresh. <laughs> you know, who's this guy? You know what I mean? Who's this wanker? You know what I mean? In, 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 in London. You know what I mean? That's what I want because it's just that crafty. And I just, I, I don't know. I feel like more using my voice as an instrument more than I've ever done it. And I like to push myself to those battles to really express myself, you know? And, it's, and that's, that's where I'm at now. To impress me, how can I use my voice? I think you have a truly international sound. You really do. Um, whether it's cultivated or whether it just came naturally to you, um, it's something that comes off. It sounds like something that could be played anywhere in the world. At least, especially the stuff you've done in the last five years. Was that on purpose or is that something you just came from traveling so much more? Yeah, that's why I decided to go by International Jones. You know, I just feel like there's a guy that he wears two suits. You know, he's like a, a um, uh, like an a agent. You know what I'm saying? Like 007, his family know him like this, but the world know him as this, you know? And I feel like that with the music. I travel, everybody don't know what you capable of, you know, the the master of ceremony. 
So yeah, the International Jones moniker for me to make it mesh with the music, that was my aim. And it just so happened that I, I hit it on a nail. Yeah, thank you. That's all I got. Thank you, sir. Cool, cool, cool.